Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Peaceful Solution Character Education Certification course. Everyone in the auditorium can be seated. And those of you that are coming in, welcome. Coming in from out of the cold here in Texas as we, we are in winter. You know, I kind of envy those I talk to in South America that are just beginning summer. Um, but your summers are much nicer than what we had. We get up into 110, and your summers are like 85. So <laughs> your summers are, more, are much nicer. But once again, welcome everyone that is here internationally. All of you welcome also. Um, tonight, we're going to try to complete the self-control unit. That way we can start our next class in the respect unit. So it's really important if you don't have a respect unit uh, to download the one that's there on our Facebook page. It's the official peaceful solution. If you're watching on our app, um, just go to the official peaceful solution. You can download the respect unit free of charge. If you have any problems, just email us. Um, you can email us at info at peacefulsolution.org. Once again, that's info at peacefulsolution.org. Or you can just send us a message through Facebook if you're having any problems, and we'll work with you however we need to to make sure that you have this curriculum. And once again, the most asked questions, can we make copies of these books? Absolutely. Just do not change anything that's in the book. Please leave the books as they are written, and don't alter any of the uh lesson plans or any of the information, uh, there's nothing wrong. As you see, we do in these classes, we get current information and we try to tie these things in together. So there's nothing wrong with adding those things into your classes. In fact, we encourage that to make sure as you're teaching classes, you get things that are local to your area, but also things that affect everyone on a global scale. You know, it, here as we sit right now in Abilene, Texas, uh, talking about uh, pollution, and we've talked about how volcanoes are natural pollution. We have one of the largest, or if not the largest volcano in the world that is erupting uh, in Hawaii at this time. So these things are always occurring. And of course, we all actually reap either the uh, the benefits or the repercussions of it, one or the other. But here tonight, if you go ahead and turn over to LP7E, that's Lesson Plan 7, that's Chapter 7, Page E, um, we're going to go ahead and start with Procedure 9, and we'll get back through taking a review of not just uh, not just Chapter 7 tonight, but we're going to tie in some of the other chapters into it also, as much as time will allow, because it usually takes it usually takes a solid hour to get through the What I Have Learned section, and to have a, a fair discussion, especially with your classroom. When you're having a discussion with your classroom, you'll find it might take a couple of hours. But here in Procedure 9... It says you have an activity, and of course, that's the billboard found on page 218, and it says to tell students that they will now create their own billboard with a slogan to help others consider how they treat the environment. Explain that they might choose from one of the three categories, pollution of the air, water, or food supply. Upon completion, allow students to share their slogans with the class. Discuss the impact that they think these slogans would have on society and helping people remember to show care and concern for our planet. And if you turn over there to page 18, which, what you'll see is you have a, you know, kind of a square there. And, of course, they can do it on a piece of paper. They can do it on a poster board. Uh, whatever you have that you can supply for your classroom. But here you just have a, a an open square box. But once again, just as creative as you can be, because you should actually not just do these. Find the best ones, you know. And, and actually post them, put them out for your communities to see, because we can all benefit from these things. And we live in a, a society today with technology that you could put a poster up in, you know, somewhere on the other side of the world. You can name any place and people from everywhere could see it. I've never been on TikTok. I really don't know much about what TikTok is, but I hear that everybody can make videos and send them everywhere. I guess I haven't heard of one worth watching yet. But if there is one about pollution or how to save the environment, I would, I would most definitely watch it. So someone should challenge themselves with doing some of those videos, too. Um, I just, uh, I'm not of the generation that is always on the computer or a phone or whatever it is that they display that on. But here, after that is done, once again, make it exciting for them to do. But we really need to get through the uh, what I have learned. So if you turn back to your procedures in procedure 10, that's the only procedure. I say only, but that's a lot of, that's a whole class right there with the activity. But in procedure 10, it says conclude the lesson by having students listen to and discuss the poem Care on page 219. Now, if you turn over to page 219, if you get our PDF files 
that we email the poem, the MP4 is embedded into the book itself. All you have to do is click and play. Um, we also have CDs. You can request CDs, um, and those can also be used, or you can just have your greatest philosopher stand up and read it for you. Tonight, I'll have to do. I'm not the greatest, but I'll have to do for this poem. And it's entitled Care. And it says, pollutants in our atmosphere. Stop, think, take the time to care. We just can't do anything we want to do, for it affects me and it affects you. Toxic substance illegally dumped in our water, contamination is making our life shorter. Some say we live longer today. They didn't hear it from the five million that passed away. Annually from diseases in the water, someone's mother, son, or little daughter. Mad cow disease in the meats they eat, genetically altered corn and pesticides in the wheat. What will be the long-term effects to our bodies, many question, of eating meats and vegetables filled with contamination? Only time will tell what the effects will be of the pollution in our water, air, water, land, and sea. Take the time now to show you care, pay attention, and become more aware. If you don't have this part underlined, underline this last section because this is truly very powerful and it will tie into class tonight. We are the caretakers of this planet on which we live. What we do now is our legacy to give. To future generations, it is up to each one of us to practice self-control and keep our focus. On making choices that is best for you and me, the air we breathe, food we eat, lakes and sea. And of course, a lot of these poems were written by what were our young students, teenage students, back when these books first came out. And they're now in their 30s and, and middle 30s at this time. Uh, but notice that we are caretakers of this planet. Well, we're supposed to be caretakers of this planet. And that's, that's where the blame falls. Or um, when things are done properly, that's where the congratulation comes in order. And we've got a lot of work to do before we can start patting ourselves on the back and saying we've done a great job, but we can sure start and have that direction. But looking back here to LP7E, after reading the poem, the last instruction of this book is instruct students to read the section, What I Have Learned, found on page 220. Emphasize to students that a part of developing a positive moral character is becoming more environmental uh, conscious, environmentally conscious. In this way, they will be able to make better choices concerning the environment for the benefit of future generations. Encourage students to remember the lessons learned in uh, this unit of the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program and to consistently practice self-control as they interact with all people. Now, so turning over to the What I Have Learned section, and I've kind of limited this to uh, so we can make sure we get everything in in one hour because Really, with chapter seven of each book, you could tie in the whole book. You could tie in chapters one through six along with chapter seven because it takes chapters one through six to put chapter seven together. And you'll see when we started this journey uh, of what we've learned, notice the first part here. It says in point one, it says, as caretakers, we need to consider how our, our actions affect the environment. And I want to show you, um, we're going to cover what's in chapter 7, but I want to show you one thing really quickly on page 6. So you see that we started this journey a long time ago, uh, many, many months ago, actually. But on page 6, you see the section Handle with Care. And, of course, you see the cartoon there with the young man throwing his wrapper and his drink on the ground. And notice here it says moral principles, and remember what morals are. They're rules. Those are the rules that keep us safe. They keep society safe. They keep the environment clean. But these moral principles can also be applied to the environment and how we care for it. We're caretakers for it. We need air, water, plants, and animals to survive, and all of these things make up our environment. When we do our part to care for our environment by not polluting the earth and with litter or using harsh man-made chemicals that contaminate our land, water supply, and atmosphere, we are demonstrating regard for all life. Now, that was on page six. And think of all the things that we went through from learning about our emotions, how to deal with anger, 
Um, also, the effects that we that we can receive from watching certain types of entertainment, listening to certain types of music. Uh, we talked about how self control affects society with crime and so forth, and we even talked about disease. And then we tied all of those things together because we all live in this society that we call Earth. And you can say each and every one of us have our individual houses, and that would be true. But when we step out of those houses, we all live on Earth. And no matter what country we live in, uh, no matter whether it's the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere, there's some things that can be done by a few that will affect everyone drastically. But look over here to page 7. And notice it says, why do I need self-control? This is just to keep it in the, the minds of not just yourself, but also your students. Notice it says, when you control your thoughts, feelings, and actions, you will make choices that will not cause harm to yourself or others. That's why we all need to develop the self-control so we do not bring harm to ourself or others. Now, turning back, going back into chapter 7, since uh, it will be a really pressured time just to get it done, Look over to page 187 in chapter 7, and this was the introduction to the unit. And once again, we're talking about, as caretakers, we need to consider how our actions affect the environment. And starting here in the second paragraph, notice it says, in this final chapter, which is chapter 7, Self-Control in the Environment, we will expand the concept of self-control to include the environment. Now, notice we talked about it in the beginning of the book, and we built up to it, and then we tie it all together here at the end. We will explore ways in which our choices, and it's very important to realize they're all our choices, pollute and contaminate our air, water, and food supply. The word environment encompasses all living things as well as the atmosphere, soil, and all bodies of water. So if you'll remember back all of the things that were shown from the largest animal that was uh, in the sea to the dead animals that were being ground up and rendered um, to the very small microbes that had to be magnified 400 times just for us to be able to see on the camera. All of these things, whether they were alive or dead, was shown how all of this affects the earth, and it affects each and every one of us also. Continuing on here, it says the earth is the only home we have, and we rely on it to provide us with everything we need to, to sustain our lives. In return, we have a responsibility to care for this beautiful planet, for we are the caretakers of the, of the earth and are obligated to preserve its resources for future generations. You know, and it's ironic, um, always bring back to your students' mind how much money we spend exploring outer space, but we don't spend a lot of money trying to make sure things are done um, in a very sanitary way here on earth. Uh, as David said, it's the bottom line that people look for. The bottom dollar is what people look for. And of course, on page 219, we talked about how we're caretakers. In the poem we just read, we talked about how we are the caretakers of the planet in which we live. And if we don't take care of it, who will? Nobody will. If we wait for somebody else to pick up our trash, it'll never get picked up. Well, turning back over to page 220, because some of these bullet points are going to have a lot of pages to turn to. And on page 220, back to what I have learned in point two, it says pollution is the contamination of the environment with waste materials. Pollution can result in damage to the environment, human health, and the overall quality of life. So look back over to page 188. 188. And of course, remember, we first start out by talking about what exactly is pollution. Notice it says the contamination of the environment is what our bullet point says there, the second bullet point. And on page 188, we learned what pollution was. And it once again repeats, pollution is the contamination of the environment with waste material. Pollution causes potential damage to the environment, human health, and overall quality of life. Pollutants can basically be, basically be placed into two categories, natural pollutants and man-made pollutants. But also remember what we discussed, natural pollutants that are not dealt with properly um, become man-made pollutants. Um, there are some things that 
I would say 99.999% of everyone on this earth does. I only put that in there because I've, I've met people that through certain health problems do not. But use the bathroom. That's a natural pollutant. But when it's not processed properly and we try to process it faster and not let the soil, remember those living, more, uh, those living organisms in the soil not process these things, when we try to do a more rapid way of doing it, and it's the bottom dollar, and we inject these chemicals into it to try to make us not as sick, that's when we start creating more pollution. Because, and think about this, well, how does this take place? Well, if someone who has a stomach virus, they spread the stomach virus, as we've covered in this class, it goes through the spreading of fecal matter. That's the only way you have to ingest the fecal matter that has the virus in it. Uh, there's a lot of other diseases that are coming up, such as polio that's in New York again. It's spread the same way, and it spreads rapidly. Watch how a stomach virus will go through a whole city, and you think, that's the only way to get it? That's how fast it spreads. It sure is. That's how filthy of a world we live in. Well, that's how one, when we don't dispose of things properly, that's how it affects the whole world. And then look here at the last paragraph on page 188. It says, although some pollutants is a result of natural causes, such as the eruption of volcanoes, which you're going to see that a lot in the news in the next couple days, if not weeks, uh, this, that spew enormous amount of smoke and ash into the atmosphere. The majority of pollutants is a, real, is a result of human activities. Now, one thing interesting about volcanoes that you should research with your students, it spews up an ash, and when it mixes with the rain or the clouds, they say that it rains like an ash water. It's very interesting that the earth could actually create something that um, could resemble lye soap, you know, which you've seen before. If you go to the store, you buy soap. That's That was very common back in the turn of the century of 1800s to 1900s. So it's very interesting how the earth can create kind of its own way of scrubbing itself too. I thought that was very interesting when I seen that in the news today. And then looking over here from page 188 to 193, and of course we covered a lot of different things to dealing with how uh, what we do pollutes the earth. And on page 193 here, uh, you'll see it where it starts in the first paragraph. It's the first or the second sentence, we'll go ahead and read the first sentence. It says, industrial waste in the forms of billows of black smoke pour from thousands of smoke stacks as coal-powered trains carried supplies across the country. Well, that was how things have changed. But notice here it says, in addition to industrial factories, we also have millions of cars, planes, and other modes of transportation adding to the pollution of our environment. Well, what is one way that vehicles can contaminate? You know, everybody wants to say the exhaust, but when cars are not maintained properly, uh, you have oil leaks, you have antifreeze that leak out. Antifreeze is not a healthy thing to drink. You know, it, it pretty much will end your life. Uh, also, motor oil, that's not something you would go to drink. It has its purpose, but it's not for you to ingest. And of course, when these things get spilled on the road, here in Abilene, we don't really have a drainage system. When it rains heavily, the waters flood and everything runs into the rivers or the creeks. And that's where all the antifreeze, the oil, and every other substance that's spilled on the pavement or the asphalt in the city of Abilene, that's where it all goes. Um, there's no secret place. To, you know, there's no divider that's splitting off the clean water from the dirty water. It just all goes to the same place. But notice it says here in the second paragraph that some will argue that technology comes with a price. As long as we continue to grow as a society with increasing needs for housing, energy, and transportation, we will automatically have some adverse effects on the environment. But let me ask you and also remind your students, if you start doing things and you can start and create a system to where you're building, you're doing transportation, and you're living in a healthy way, and everybody's trying to eliminate these pollutants that can harm each other, how would increasing more people keeping the rules bring harm? Harm only comes when you increase people who are not keeping rules, and that spreads things. And it only takes a few to spread a lot of disease. Also, looking over to page 194, notice we read what comes around goes around. 
And in the second paragraph, it says, if we continue contaminating the soil, and remember those microbes we've seen, it's very important, extremely important to remember when you have a seed that's in a packet or you take a seed out of a watermelon or a peach or a plum or whatever and you put it into the ground, it's what's in the ground that actually gives life to this seed. The seed itself can't grow without these microbes that are in the ground that actually give it the substance it needs to bring forth life. Now, when we contaminate that, we're taking away our food supply and many other things, but mainly our food supply right now. If we continue contaminating the soil and the air, then we will no longer have clean, fresh air to breathe or rich soil in which to plant. If you think the air you breathe is fresh enough, then consider this cold, hard fact. And of course, it was the one in 1948 where 19 people died as a result of polluted air in the town of Denora, Pennsylvania. And you can also go online. It, it helps for your students to see if they're close to dairy farms. Uh, this is pretty common knowledge where dairy farms run off methane. It's pretty common for people to die from methane at dairy farms. It's, you can see it in the news every year where somebody, you can't smell it or taste it as far as the death part of it. It's got a smell. But you can actually go into a chamber where the methane is housed and not realize that you're being overwhelmed and you're, you're, once you pass out, it's pretty much done. But these are things that can be harnessed and used, but they can also uh, end the life very quickly. But also turning over to page 197, talking about these contaminants that we spread, and we spread them by not keeping the rules. We're not using self-control uh, to worry about keeping ourselves and others safe. And just so you know, if, you, if you're new to these, uh, what we do is we take these bullet points and we write all these pages with our bullet points. So we're on the second bullet point right now. We would have, all the teachers always write these pages down and you'll find more as you go too. And you'll end up with 20 and 30 pages sometimes on a bullet point throughout the whole book. But let's take a closer look at air. Notice we also read and discussed about how it doesn't matter how long you can hold your breath. Sooner or later, you will have to breathe. If you want to live, you're going to have to. Air is essential to life, and not just any air, but clean, unpolluted air. The demands of our modern society, society have greatly increased the amount of pollutions in our air. In many parts of the world, air pollution has reached dangerous levels. Uh, notice, and it gives examples of automobile industries, automobile exhaust, also industrial factories, now, a lot of these come from the not processing of chemicals that are reaching and coming into contact with um, everyday society. And of course, here you also have things such as smog. You see here um, right below the industrial factories, the first paragraph, it says some of the harmful chemicals that pollute our air from these sources are carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen oxide. With the, help of the, with the help of sunlight, these chemicals react with our atmosphere and produce what is commonly known as smog. Smog is a combination of smoke and fog. The smog is visible as a dense haze that floats over many cities all over the world. And notice here, pollution in the form of smog is no laughing matter. I remember the first time I seen that in a city I was with uh, two friends who were also Peaceful Solution teachers at the time, and we were traveling into New Orleans um, from Lafayette. And the, one of the teachers pointed out, look at the smog over the city. And it's the first time I ever seen a bowl of like clouded, look, like the whole city was on fire, and that was the smoke over it. But it wasn't. It was just the smog, and it literally was just right over the city. Everything else looked clean, but of course it wasn't. But it looked cleaner than what we were seeing there with the smog itself. And then looking over to page 198, page 198, we see that another consequence, this is the, uh, set, the first full paragraph, another consequence of air pollution is acid rain. Acid rain is just as dangerous as it sounds. It is created when sulfur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen mix with water vapor. When this dangerous combination falls to the earth and form in the form of rain, it corrodes uh, marble statues and buildings. In addition to this, acid rain can seriously damage forests, crops, and other plants. 
it makes streams and lakes unsuitable for fish and other wildlife. Acid rain has been known to contaminate fish so they cannot reproduce. So think about that. Actually sterilizing our food production system. That's not a very smart thing to do if you're using fish to feed people. You start making your fish sterile and you won't be able to get any more. And then also looking over to page 199. 199, you see that controlling the air we breathe, we've talked about that already briefly. And it says clean air is essential to great health. Once again, we have the smog and the acid rain being tied back into this, which can lead to notice sickness and the destruction of forests and lakes is not something society can afford to ignore. The Clean Air Act passed in 1970 requires that our air contain limited amounts of pollutants. This also makes industrial factories and other sources of air pollutants accountable for the amounts of pollution that they allow into the atmosphere. Um, but think about if you allow a little bit in, a little bit every day, how much does that add up to at the end of your lifetime? Um, remember, we've seen uh, the, just in the last class, the man that got the pork tapeworm, and we've seen that when you buy a pack of meat at the grocery store, a little bit of pork is allowed to be in there. Now, keep in mind, they told you that if you cook it well enough, you can kill it. Most people out in society, the most common, and I didn't know this until I was reading about it, the most commonly requested way of cooking meat is medium rare, which is pretty raw. Now, if you have a little bit of pork mixed in with that, which scientists say, you can look it up, they say to eat pork, you pretty much have to incinerate it. In other words, it wouldn't even be there because it's full of bacteria. But there are people that enjoy eating those types of things, but I personally wouldn't want, to me, it's like playing Russian roulette. You, you take the gun, you put in uh, seven bullets in an eight-round system and start slinging it around. There might be that one time where you think you got by with it. But here, notice also the Environmental Protection Agency, also known as the EPA. So here we're creating organizations, organizations to pass rules so they can fine people for breaking the rules is what it is. It was created to monitor and notice enforce the standards set by the Clean Air Act. In addition to this, states and local governments assist in controlling pollutants in their jurisdiction in a variety of ways. Some states, like California, for instance, offer incentives for people to carpool, thereby limiting the amount of cars on the road. Uh, but once again, we can't fool ourselves into thinking that we have this glass wall around our state and the rules we keep in our state won't affect other states. Um, California has a lot of restrictions on what can and can't be done, but it's proven that it's not helping their state become any cleaner. And then you have notice here the efforts to keep our air clean. There's things that are being done. And then looking over to page 200, we had straight talk. And once again, it was another way that pollution can be put into our atmosphere. Then it says daily activities such as heating our homes, driving our cars, and even burning charcoal for a barbecue will produce some pollutants. So that's just normal. That's some pollutants. We ourselves produce pollutants. Society has not yet found a way to live without polluting the environment to some degree. What society has to do, remember, as we went through this, is find out how to properly dispose of the pollutants. By controlling the amount of pollution that is in, put into the air, raising the awareness of the public to become more uh, conservation-minded and setting standards of what is acceptable, we as a society are practicing self-control and making positive choices to take better care of our environment. And once again, you see thirst anyone the last sentence there of the first paragraph, it says the pollution of our waters is like the pollution of the air, has the potential to affect all life on our planet. That's one thing that ties us all together. The water we drink, which you have to drink water. I know some are bitterly opposed to letting that ever come through their lips. But no matter what you do, you can't escape uh, partaking of water. You have to have it to live. Your body is mostly made up of water. And, of course, the air we breathe, that are two things that we have to have. You cannot avoid them. And looking over to page 201 at the very top of the page, we see water pollution is a major problem in the world today. And according to the Center for Disease Control, also known as the CDC, is responsible for over 900,000 illnesses and approximately 1,000 deaths per year in the United States alone. Uh, on a global scale, Billions of people are affected by polluted waters, and we went into a lot of details showing how people all around the world are, are subject to 
uh, like cholera, and if they are infected and they actually how we're it's a disgusting topic to bring up, but how when someone in America gets diarrhea, you can pretty much process yourself through it. Someone in certain parts of Africa get it. It's pretty much like a death sentence. Um, and it literally sucks the life right out of you because you're pushing all the water out that you need. But once again, it says in addition to water pollutants uh, has been linked to cancer, birth defects in both human and animal population. Once again, these are pollutants that are not being processed properly. It's not showing care and concern for others. As we talked about, that's why we need self-control, so we can learn to have respect and regard uh, each other. And then from 201, look over to page 204, and it says, just the facts on water pollution, and here you had the facts, and of course, this is where I bring this page up because this is where you'll want to try to update your facts to where you live and then use your state and then use the country you live in, whether you live in, if you're living in Mexico or if you're living in Nigeria or Kenya or if you're living somewhere in Europe, you know, or even Asia, wherever you're living, try to get statistics for there also and, and update these because these are, these are fairly old and things have changed a lot. But you'll find if you'll compare these statistics to newer statistics, Things haven't gotten better. We've created agencies, we've given out fines, but things have not gotten a lot better. And then looking over to page 205, and it says the damage is already done. Fish that lived in polluted waters become contaminated. Because the concentration of contaminants increase further up the food chain, humans are the top predators. Humans, once again, who are the top predators are at greater risk. Being at the top of the food chain simply means that we can eat all of the food that we want that are healthy and appropriate, but nothing eats us. Well, sadly, we eat stuff that aren't healthy also. <laughs> we become a very, uh, we might be the top of the food chain, but it doesn't mean we're the smartest sometimes. Sometimes people will eat things that don't bite them back first. But here it says, a person who regularly eats contaminated fish will end up with higher concentrations of contaminants in his body. And of course, what takes place whenever you try to bring forth children? Well, you see here with the fish that it sterilizes some of the fish where they can't even breed any longer. And then looking over to page 206 for the very last one on this topic. And of course, that it ties into pollution so much that is hit in so many places uh, this is just rehearsing into the mind of the students the things we went over. And it says, One study done on pollution of the Great Lakes in Michigan proved that there was a definite link between PCB birth defects, impaired learning abilities, and aggressive behavior in children. And notice here that it shows that the babies had lower birth weight, smaller head size, brains that were underdeveloped, weak reflexes, jerky, unbalanced movements, uh, and when we look at society and we think about, well, how did that man in Virginia, why did he just take a gun and go inside and shoot people? And we start looking at all of these things that take place. And you know one thing that no one ever comes up with? No one ever provides the answer to why these things are taking place. They're not getting better. And we've seen in society where you can take guns away and they'll stab each other. That's what took place in the U.K., um, you know, I go to Mexico quite often. I don't see many guns down there, but when they go to take a life, they take a life down there if they want to. And if a gun's not available, they find other means. They're very creative, not just in Mexico. This is all around the world. You don't have to have a gun to take a life. Look at Japan and China. There's a lot of things take place there, but rarely do you hear about uh, a life taken with a gun. But when it does take place, you have somebody like a former prime minister that was shot in front of everybody, and the whole world's seen it. So these things affect, but what causes the mind to go that way? Well, if you would consider, and this is a challenge, if you would consider it's not just the entertainment, it's not just the music they listen to, it can also be part of the food they eat, the air they breathe, and the contaminants that we put in the society that's around us. All of these toxins poisons that we put into the body, it's the same thing as taking a car and you start putting things that were never supposed to be in the motor and you expect it to run. It's not going to run properly and it's going to break down. Well, sometimes when humans break down, they break down very violently and they take the lives of others. 
And a lot of people could say, well, I don't know about that. I challenge you to look at it. Look at what takes place when we allow things into the mind. Um, research what takes place. One of, the, one of the greatest researches you can do, and you'll find a lot online, research how syphilis affects the brain. There are many articles out there that shows when someone dies of syphilis after they've had it, doesn't really get rid of it. It stayed there for a while. It literally turns the brain into looking like Swiss cheese. It literally devours the brain. You know, and these are things that come from allowing contaminants from disease and other things into the body. Well, moving along here, if you turn back to page 220, <clears throat> page 220, where this would be the third bullet point. And it says, everyone in our society, so everyone, that means all, everyone, no matter whether you're Russian, Chinese, American, uh, Ukrainian, Mexican, Peruvian, no matter who you are, this is everyone. From leaders and policymakers to owners of factories and refineries to ordinary people must take responsibility for preserving our environment because we are dependent upon the earth for all of our needs. And if you'll look back over to page 189, and this is once again in chapter 7, we depend on the earth for all of our needs. And, you know, no matter how many times uh, billionaires send up things to Mars and Venus, we're not going to be going there. Uh, you know, we've got to make do with what we have. And on page 189, of course, looking here at the bottom paragraph underneath, how do we practice self-control in regards to the environment? Notice it said in the previous chapter, speaking of chapter 6, you learned that self-control is the ability to stop, think, and make choices that are moral. Once again, they follow along with these rules, and notice they show value for life. That shows care and concern. The same concept applies to our environment as well. Everyone in our society, notice from leaders, policymakers, to owners of factories and refineries, to ordinary people, must take. You know, that word must is a very strong word. It must, that means there's not an option. If we want the best outcome, we have to do it. Must take responsibility for preserving the environment because we are dependent on the earth for all of our needs. Now, if you depend on somebody for something, how, how great is it? If you're depending on somebody for something and you give them a little poison every day, or you give, you know, just give them a punch in the gut every other day, or you do something that brings them down. If you're dependent on them and then you destroy the very thing you're dependent on, you know, it's like the old saying, you cut the throat to spite the belly. It's not a very smart thing to do. And unlike, you know, you don't take care of your car, you know, I change it every 30,000 miles whether it needs it or not. You know, if you don't take care of your car, it's going to break down. If you don't take care of your body and your health, it's going to break down. If we don't take care of the earth, where do you get another one from? It's kind of like your body. You can't go down to the local box store and get a new body, and you're not going to go somewhere and buy a new earth. We got to clean up the trash can, so to speak. When the trash can smells and it stinks, well, that's when it's time to scrub it. You know, get some, uh, get some things that can actually kill the bacteria making the smell, and actually do it in a very healthy way. It's just like when your house gets dirty, you clean it. Well, you can also prevent your house from getting dirty by maintaining how you dispose of things. A lot of people don't do that. Uh, it's when it smells, it's time to clean. Um, but also the earth. The earth, it's beyond, it smells, it's time to clean. It's way beyond that. It's to the point now where you even see where they're reporting, as we showed in the videos, the fertilizers are killing the microbes. Now, those are the things that bring our foods out. That's what brings the health to the fruits and vegetables you eat. That's what helps you and I to be energetic and to do our jobs. Well, without that, we're not going to have much success. But once again, here at the very last sentence of this paragraph, it says, in practicing self-control, once again, we must stop and consider how the choices we make as we live our daily lives, affect our abilities and the abilities of other life forms to survive and function. Does that mean whenever you're pouring something on the ground, you should think about how it affects the microbes and the bacteria in the ground? It absolutely does. Absolutely. So the next time someone wants to give you some genetically modified seeds, you should consider how's it going to affect the ground. The next time you spray something uh, that they say are giving humans cancer, you should probably consider what it's doing to the microbes that are in the ground too. 
You have to remember, a very wise man once told me, if you're trying to kill what's on top of the ground, you do it by what's giving its life underneath the ground. So you're not really killing the plant, you're killing what's fueling the plant. And that can be a very dangerous thing. It could be cutting the throat to spite the belly, so to speak, once again. Um, also turn over to page 191. And notice it's all about our attitudes. And remember, that's how we started off in the character unit. It's your attitude, you know, not only about yourself and others, but the environment you live in. Our behavior and attitude about the environment we live in. That was one of the three. And, of course, that determines whether we live in a contaminated wastebasket or we live in a very healthy place. Well, right now it's kind of a, kind of a contaminated health you know, wastebasket in most of society. But notice your attitude is the way you think and feel about something. To practice self-control regarding the environment, once again, here's that must word, you must have a caring attitude about the world around you. This means not taking the air you breathe and the food you eat and the water you drink for granted. When you take something for granted, you assume that it will always be there for your use. The truth is, unless we care for our environment, clean air, water, and nutritious, healthy food uh, might not always be there for our use. And we really need it. You, you have to have it to survive. And looking here at the last paragraph, don't wait until you are adversely affected by contaminants in the environment to take notice of your food, water supply, and air supply, or water and air supply. Develop a caring attitude about the environment because the quality of your life is affected by the world around you. And that's a very true statement. You know, here you're going to have the flu, which is already spreading, but it's spreading everywhere in society. You still have COVID. I've just seen where South America is going through what they're calling the fifth wave. You see in China where it's spreading and they're trying to limit people. The people are now fighting back. They've had so much, the mental pressure, they can't stand it anymore. And it's also spreading in Europe and it's spreading in the United States also. It still continued to spread. Um, and of course, they thought they were going to take these injections like fertilizing the ground and they were going to get the upper hand on this virus. But it's a lot like where we showed where they were feeding the chickens and animals these antibiotics and they've created super um, super bacteria to where the antibiotics can't control them. The antibiotics have outsmarted the um, or the, the bacteria have outsmarted the antibiotics. Well, here in America, if everybody watches the news, you see that people who are vaccinated now outweigh the deaths of people that are unvaccinated. So obviously these injections did not do as much as they thought they would. They had hopes they would, but there comes a time where you have to start thinking, well, what do we need to do? What do we need to do to actually clean up our environment? And that's something we should all consider. Let's go ahead and turn back over to page 202, or 220, 220, excuse me. 220. Um, hold your finger there. I want to remind you of what we first started out with, and this is in every, this is in every Peaceful Solution Junior High Series book. Um, and remember, we were talking about leaders. Sometimes these books, when they've been used so much, the pages just don't want to work. And if you remember on uh, this page XV, you had the influence from the teacher. Um, and always go back and read that because he got this from his father, which was the leader of his house. Um, but also notice that when you turn over to XV11, and this is in the introduction to the unit, the whole unit, you had there are teachers are the true leaders of the world. And this is truly inspired by the author of The Peaceful Solution. And this was the last thing that he wanted to put in the minds of everyone who teaches this program not the last thing the first thing and the last thing and once again i want to read this because this was the inspiration that he put into the minds of literally hundreds of thousands that have learned this program and it says all teachers now have the opportunity to make a great change in the character of the students remember what our character is you know it, it's not our personality a character it depends on whether we agree with these morals and we apply these morals do we keep the rules or do we break the rules 
With the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program, you are not only teaching, you are actually molding leaders who will use what you instill in them to bring about better living conditions in this world. That includes the environment. It doesn't mean having a nice house, nice car. We're talking about a healthier environment. But notice, failure to build moral values in these students will not only be reflect, reflected in the child by also in the child by also in the entire world. Things should be, but also in the entire world. Your leadership will be reflected in the actions of the leaders you have taught and will teach. So once again, when we're talking about leadership, leaders are only what we teach them to be. So looking back over here to the fourth bullet point, the fourth bullet point, it says, uh, to practice self-control, we must stop and consider how daily choices affect the ability of all forms of all life forms to survive and function. So here we start out, once again, we've covered page 191 and page 189, and they, uh, they both tie into that, um, working hand in hand with what we've covered also. But let's look, um, let's look backward to page 191, where it's all about our attitude. And notice here at the very bottom, the food for thought. It says, stop and think about what you're putting into your body and how you're treating it because it's the only body you're going to get. And that's that practicing self-control. And not just what we pour on the ground or what we put in the toilet. You know, they tell you don't put dangerous chemicals in the toilet. It affects the water supply. We'll also be careful about what you put into your body itself. And also look back over. There's a couple pages we want to cover since uh, we'll have a little bit of time. On page four, looking back over to page four, because we want to see how we build up to all of this and how all of these things tie together. And yes, Everything ties together, even down to the food we eat, the way we conduct ourselves. Uh, it all ties into what our lives will become and the contaminants that we will live in. Do we want to live in a clean place or do we, do we not mind just living in filth? You know, but notice here at the very beginning, what is self-control? Notice it's controlling, that is guiding and directing what you think because, what you, because thoughts lead to feelings. And then controlling what you feel because feelings lead to actions. When you talk about these things with your students, we've put a lot of thoughts into their minds about what is done to contaminate. Um, some would say defile. Some would say poison the earth itself. Ask them what their thoughts are on it and why it's so important because notice the third one, controlling how you behave because these decisions lead to actions which lead to rewards or consequences. Well, you have to put that with the second one because these thoughts lead to feelings, and those feelings are going to lead to actions. That's the only way you can motivate someone to make a change, and that's to put this thought of what needs to be done and what we're doing that's wrong and how we can fix it, and it will put forth this emotion, these feelings, to bring forth these actions. But notice once again that self-control is the foundation of moral behavior, the moral behavior, the behavior where people adhere to rules. When you practice self-control, you stop and consider whether your thoughts and feelings will lead to actions that are morally correct and in your best interest. Not only your best interest, but the interest of everyone around you. You know, we live together. Whether we like it or not, this world was given to all of us, and we have to learn to live together on it. And looking over to page 9, looking over to page 9, and in the second paragraph on page 9, Notice it says, even though you have been developing self-control through the guidance of adults in your life, it's now up to you to determine to practice self-control. Notice of your own free will. Keep in mind that if you have to be forced or constantly reminded to follow an instruction, then you are not practicing self-control. Well, and I'm not knocking the EPA or any other organization, but if we have to create organizations that force people to keep the rules, we're accepting that the uh, not having self-control is acceptable because now we've got to find a way to force them to comply. It would be better to actually teach people a way where they desire to comply. You know, there's not much money into that, but finishing here, it says, it is important to understand that self-control is about what you do and the choices you make, especially 
when you are not under the direct supervision of adults or environmental agencies or, you know, everybody slows down when they see the policeman when they're driving down the road, right? Whether you're speeding or not, you naturally start slowing down because you, you're not really paying attention to how fast you're going. Uh, well, that's how we need to look because right now society is going, you know, a thousand mile an hour and we're not necessarily uh, treating uh, our society in the best way. And if you look over also to page 29, page 29, notice this was controlling your emotions to your advantage. And the very first part, this is once again to reinstill in our mind, because when you talk about fixing the environment, once again, we have to make these choices of our own free will. If we got to be forced, you know, <laughs> you're going to have people that are going to continue to do it because they don't want to. It's hard work to do the right thing, to dispose of things properly and so forth. Notice it says here on page 29, you have the power to control your thoughts and the emotions that arise from the way you perceive a situation. And looking down to the second paragraph, emotions inform us of our likes, dislikes, and needs. They also help us to communicate with others and allow us to enjoy life's experiences. Without emotions, life would be dull and boring. So if you see what's going on in the environment and it upsets you, that's okay. But what are you going to do about how it made you feel? Are you just going to go along with it and say, ah, no one can fix this. It's just too big. It's just going to work its way out. You know, I'm only going to live another 30 years anyway. Let the next generation deal with it. 30 years more of, of adding filth and pollution, and uh, the next generation might not get an opportunity to deal with it when we look at it that way. But looking down here at the very last paragraph on page 29, however, it is as important as emotions are, if they are not controlled, they will control you. Emotions that are uncontrolled can lead to poor choices, which in turn can lead to impulsive behavior that you might regret. You know, and that that old saying that an impulsive decision, oh, I just wasn't thinking. Yeah, you were. <laughs> you had to consider your choices before you made them. You just made an impulsive choice. And then looking over to page 41, and this is really just to look at the bottom uh, footnote here that's in the box. But it is, it's all in the way you respond. And that's what we're talking about with the environment also. But on the bottom of page 41, it says, it is easier to practice self-control than to suffer the consequences of acting impulsively. And then um, moving along, look over to page 75. And then we're probably going to have to, we'll cover a couple more. But you can go through with your students. There is... I'll be honest, on this bullet point alone, going through this book, I think I've got 64 references. You could find your own, and you will. And I can tell you, I got all of my references from listening to our other teachers. Um, no matter how long you teach this program, when you come in and listen to other teachers teach it, you'll always get more notes. You never stop learning. I don't care how many classes you've taught, how many years you've taught it, how many times you've read the book, you will always hear something that you're like, ah, I need to put that in my book, too, because of the way it's presented, it helps us to all uh, come together in this education. But here on the very bottom of page 75, notice it says, behave in a peaceful way. Peaceful behavior means not posing any physical threat to anyone. Well, the physical threat to anyone, does that mean carrying a gun, carrying an axe down the street? Uh, or can that also mean disposing of your toxic waste in a proper way? In addition to keeping your hands and feet to yourself, peaceful behavior also includes not throwing or slamming or kicking objects. When violent behavior is practiced in front of others, it causes fear, anxiety, and tension. If your behavior causes fear, anxiety, and anxiety in others, the situation can become quickly hostile. So let me ask you, how much anxiety will you find if you know that people are putting contaminants in the food that you're eating? That would cause anxiety in me to the point that I probably wouldn't go back and eat. You know, um, I seen, and I, I don't want to mention the restaurant, but I, when they swiped that salad bowl in that video we showed last class and they found fecal matter on the rim of that, you can wash that food all you want to. When the hands that are touching it are spreading it, you know, that makes me, me personally, that's why I haven't been in a restaurant in 20 plus years. 
I just don't want to eat something that I don't know about. You know, now if I contaminate it myself, that's my own foolishness. Also look over to page 94, because we learned about the interaction and communication in this chapter. And we're also talking about this environment, which once again, that makes up all of us. Remember, society is a common group of people or a body of people that are living by a common group of rules. They're supposed to be living by these group of rules anyway. And of course, when we have problems in society, we have to deal with them through communication. And notice here on page 94, the last paragraph, it says, active listening is a powerful means of communication. We have to hear about what the problems are and then find a way to solve them. It gives you an opportunity to use self-control as you listen and then choose the right response. It's also a skill that takes notice, practice, practice, and more practice. So with that in mind, turn back over to uh, page 220 again. Um, and there's an unlimited amount, of, because you're talking about decision-making. When you're talking about to practice self-control, we must stop and consider how daily choices affect the ability of all life forms to survive and function. There is an enormous amount that's talked about that deals with decision-making and choices in this book. But due to time, we're going to go ahead and go to the next uh, bullet point here. And it's the very last one. And it says, I will not wait until I am adversely affected by contaminants in the environment to take notice of my food, water, and air supply. I will practice self-control and develop a caring attitude about the environment because the quality of life depends on that. And of course, you can remember page uh, 191 where it talked about attitude. It's all about attitude. And then you have pages 216 and 217, which was the straight talk. And of course, we talked about on 216, the third paragraph, how once again, this tied into other uh, bullet points that we covered, that it is the responsibility of our leaders. Well, who are our leaders? They're our students of today will be our leaders of tomorrow. Uh, factory owners, farmers, and automobile owners, in short, everyone who breathes air, drinks water, and eats food to develop a caring attitude about the environment, we as individuals and as a society can make, once again, choices Remember, we have to make them of our own free will. If we have to be forced, that means that as soon as you get tired of it, you're not going to do it anymore. But make choices that will protect our environment and, once again, our future generations. We have to learn to care about the ones that haven't even came yet. And then, once again, looking over to page 217, it says, uh, take a bite out of this. Are you thinking that you can't change the world by making others care about the environment? The truth is you can't make anybody do anything. The only person you can control is you. So practice self-control in how you treat the environment. And by your example, you can encourage others to do the same. No one's going to want to listen to you if you're teaching people about taking care of the environment and you're driving down to the lake and throwing your used car tires out in the lake. You know, it's not a great example to give to anyone. Looking back here on page 220, we want to read the final part here. Um, and there's just so many things that this book has. It's, it is the most requested book the Peaceful Solution has. But here in the box at the very bottom, it says the only planet, this is the only planet I have to live on. You could put we have to live on also. Therefore, I, we will do my best to care for it and practice self-control in all of my actions. And that's something that we have to work at. It takes a lot of it takes a lot of time to fix a problem sometimes. It took a lot of time to pollute something, and sometimes it takes a lot of time to clean it. Sometimes you can get a powerful pressure washer, and it'll do it all for you in an hour or two. Um, sometimes an hour is all it takes. But these things can be done. Our Earth, um, you know, you can shoot it with a pressure washer for an hour, but I think it's going to take a little bit more than that to clean it up. A lot of hard work by a lot of people. So that concludes our self-control unit uh, for this certification course. The next unit you'll want to bring, make sure you bring your teacher manual respect unit. It's very important. You can bring your self-control unit with you. Um, there's a lot of referencing that will be done to the not only the self-control, but the acceptance and the character unit. But make sure to bring your respect unit, junior high series respect unit, teacher's manual. The next class is going to be on 12-4, 12-4, um, and uh, David will be our next teacher, so it'll be at 5.30 once again on 12.4. So that should be uh, this coming Sunday. So once again, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.